Hello, hello everybody. Well, thank you for coming. And my name is Antonio Gea. I work at Google. I'm Kubernetes contributor and GK networking developer. I'm going to present with Gerrit about modern load balancing, improving application resource availability and performance. Hi, everybody. I'm Garrett. Uh, I'm here today uh, with Antonio. Thank you all for, for having us and glad to see a good turnout here. Uh, I was joking. I said maybe no one would show up. So that was sort of a little fear that I had. But uh, hopefully today we'll, we'll have a good deep dive. I play a network uh, engineer on TV, uh, work in support engineering at, at Google. Um, yeah, so why don't we, we can get started. Okay, the, the way that we are going to organize the talk, and I'm going to do a brief summary of touching several times topics about what is load balancing, what problems load balancing solves, and Garrett is going to do a more deep dive into the actual problems of load balancing and edge cases. So the first question is, why do you need a load balancer, right? Or why, why do, when should I need a load balancer? If you have just an application that you're running and you don't care about availability or performance or you don't care about service discovery, for sure you don't need a load balancer. But if this is <laughs> your situation that you care about these things, load balancer is going to be your best friend in this, in this, in this journey. So before going into the load balancer topic, let's do a first stop in what is the networking stack, how the application works, right? So if you can see in this diagram, you can see two hosts. The host has processes, right? The processes run and they want to communicate between each other. So they send a packet, open a socket. The packet goes through an application layer. These all are abstraction, right? Then the application layer assembles the, the TCP packet. The TCP packet goes to an IP, packa, IP packet and then it creates an Ethernet packet that goes through the network, right? And magically, this packet happens to appear in the networking stack of the second host and do the reverse path. It starts going up on the application layers and finally go to the other process. So what we have, we have is how, how the hell gets the packet to the other process, right? Because there is some cloud with some devices that are able to get these packets and forward to the right place, right? And one of these virtual devices is a network load balancer. Uh, a network load balancer, what it simply does is just it gets the packet and magically is able to forward the packet to another destination, right? And depending on the layer where this load balancer is working, is able to do, let's say, different things, right? If we have a load balancer at the ledger two level, the only thing that we can do is to send packets to other hosts, but the only information that we have is the, the, the in Ethernet, the MAC address, right? So typically this is, if you have a Kubernetes cluster, you can use MetaDB with the L2 mode, or if you are used to the more conventional routing, you can use BRRP to implement active passive gateway, right? But the, the, the problem of this mode is that it only works in a, in a local broadcast domain. So it's very limited for what we want, right? If we go one layer ahead, we can see that in the network layer, that layer that is typically the IP layer, we can do load balancing, right? This is commonly implemented with a routing any cache. So typically on routers, you are able to forward to one or two other hosts, but you still don't have the granularity that you want because what we want when we run applications is to forward at the layer four, at the layer four, that usually is TCP or UDP because you think that when you open an application, you open a socket, right? And the socket is listening in a, in a IP and a port. So this is the, this is the, I would say that the most common load balancer implemented. And if you go to Kubernetes, you can see that the service 
abstraction is basically that. It's basically abstracting a, a TCP, or oh, sorry, a layer four load balancer, right? You define a virtual IP and you define the ports and the protocol that you want to forward. The good thing with, with uh, virtual network devices and load balances is that you can chain it, right? With the cluster IP, we solve the problem of a pod communicating with other pods, right? You abstract the, the pods, you use a label selector, and you send the, the traffic to the virtual IP, the cluster IP, and it magically appears in one in other backend. With the problem is that we, need to send traffic from outside the cluster to the cluster. Then the common abstraction is to use a service of tight load balancer. This creates a, a chaining of load balancer. So there is an external load balancer that is able to forward traffic to the cluster where the service is able to forward traffic to the backend pods. Oh, sorry. So if we go to the last layer, we can see that there is an application layer. At the application layer, uh, there is a protocol. So when you are talking, we are talking about layer four or TCP, we are talking about the streams of data that go into IP packets. But when we are talking at the application, we already have this stream, right? And the protocol has a, high, a higher level. So this load balancer requires to reassemble all this data, parse the protocol, and based on the protocol, forward to one place or to the other. This in Kubernetes, can be mapped if only in HTTP to the ingress object, right? You have, you define a URL and the ingress object is able to forward to one service that is other for load balancer. The, the problem is that this uh, abstraction has limitations. Uh, if you attended different talks uh, during this week, you could see that the Kubernetes community is pushing towards the Gateway API. Why? Because those abstractions are getting short or have limitations or have problems. So Gateway API is coming to solve all this problem of declaring this type of load balancer, not layer 7 only, layer 4 too. So now that, that we review this brief lesson of networking and load balancing is what are the practical applications of the load balancer. So the, the, the one, when I started to say, if you have, you want high availability, how do I solve the problem with load balancing? So imagine that you have your application and you have your client, right? So you are start sending traffic and suddenly the application dies, the network is not able to forward, it means that all the clients are going to lose the connection. So your application is no longer available for this user. You can use a load balancer with health checks to pull the application and say, oh, when this application is, is dead, I just don't forward traffic to it. I forward to that, right? This is really easy to demonstrate theoretically, but Garrett will we show all the problems that are behind this later. So, uh, one uh, uh, practical application of, of this setup of using health checks and detecting the data application is to implement rolling updates. Because you have application with, with your version one, and then you want to say, okay, I want to roll out my new version, the version two. So, once you have your application, you tell your load balancer to, to get that that bucket into rotation, but you still don't start to forward traffic to it. So when you stop the first version of the application, the load balancer will detect that is no longer available and will make the application be too available. As you can see for the client, this is going to be transparent and you are able to achieve rolling updates with zero disruption. Other application for, for load balancers are using chaining is to implement high availability, re regional high availability. If you are in a data, imagine that you have requirements, your application need to run in a, in, a, in a region and be available in different countries. So one of the typical setups is to set up a different cluster in different zones or just different nodes in different zones. 
and have a load balancer in front of them that is regional. So if one of the data centers goes down, it is able to detect it and forward the traffic to the other data center. But as we said before, this can be chained and you can keep growing. So instead of uh, your failure domain to be a continent, you can see, oh, I have an application that has to be worldwide available. So you keep chaining load balancer, right? And that allows you to have full availability. That are very simple case, cases of uh, high, availability, high availability problems. But when we started, we talked too about performance problems. So the performance problems can be because you know that the application is running a host and is going to be bounded by the CPU and the memory of this host. So the more clients that you get, the more low, the more CPU and memory that this application needs to consume. But these resources are not infinite, right? So it can be that the application cannot keep up with the load. So some of the clients are not going to be able to have answers. So your application is not going to be available for these clients. Their performance is going to be degraded. So the solution, the common solution is to scale up, right? One common solution is, but the problem is that if you are in Kubernetes, this, there are efforts to solve this problem. So the pods can be scaled up and add more resources, but this has a lot of side effects and, and uh, is complicated to achieve. So the most common solution is to scale up. What you do is you put a load balancer in front of your application and then you can create more copies of your application. The load balancer is going to be to distributing the load between the different applications. This can be useful because it's just not only to have better performance, it's that also can save costs because you can auto-scale dynamically the number of backends. And with that, Garrett, you are going to explain the internals of all the load balancing problems. Sure, thank you. So I'm gonna dig in a little bit, uh, looking, peeling back a layer of magic. Uh, but first I wanna, wanna kind of separate load balancers into, into a couple of different categories. Uh, I find this helpful to conceptualize. First category is a pass-through load balancer or something like a pass-through network load balancer. And the second category is a proxy load balancer which can include things like application load balancing. When I say pass-through, I mean a load balancer that can process any uh, OSI layer three, layer four protocol, so TCP, UDP, and, and other friends. Uh, I also mean something uh, that acts as a router. So it does not terminate a connection. So if we're thinking about something like a TCP connection, there's not two, there's just one at routes. Uh, uh, request packets arrive on the network interface of the backend, so the node. And they arrive bearing the destination IP address of the VIP. So this is a true, uh, true pass-through load balancer. There's no, there's no DNAT. Uh, and then, of course, the node will perform DNAT uh, to the pod IP address. And we'll get into a little bit more detail about, about that path. The pod will reply. And then the node will perform SNAT and change the source from the pod's IP back to the load balancer's VIP. And so we have something called direct server return. And this is nice for the pass-through load balancer because, in our opinion, this works really well for services of type load balancer. It's not the only way to do services of type load balancer. Uh, as an example, in GKE Kubernetes, this is, this is how we do it. For a proxy load balancer, we're talking about something that's generally always TCP-based. Uh, there's two TCP connections. You can think of the first TCP connection between the client and the proxy or the proxy software being pods running in the cluster or, or something outside the cluster. And then the second TCP connection between those proxies and the serving pods. And this is typically done at like an application layer, something that's layer four or above. So we could say, like we use the terms proxy network load balancer when we mean something like a TCP or SSL proxy. And we use application load balancer when we're talking about HTTP and friends. And in an ideal implementation, the load balancer will be able to establish that second TCP connection uh, between the proxy software and the pods directly. So the pods use IP addresses that are routable on the network. So we call that container native or container native load balancing. The pod, of course, would reply to the proxy. And again, in an ideal uh, implementation, the pod IPs are routable on the network. The proxy receives the pods response packet and the proxy copies the data from it 
into uh, its own packet to send back to the client. And these, are, these can be used for services of type load balancer, uh, but they're really kind of perfect for, for gateway and ingress, as, as Antonio said. I'm going to focus a little bit on the life of a packet for a pass-through load balancer uh, and just sort of work through this at a high level and then, and then dig in. So if we start, I'm using documentation uh, IP address ranges here, by the way. So uh, this could apply to either an internal or an external load balancer if you want to imagine the sources and destinations in, in either way. Uh, but we have a request packet. And in this case, the source is the client and the destination is the IP address of the load balancer or the FIP. And this packet is transmitted across the network. The routing uh, capability of the, the pass-through load balancer will deliver that to one of, one of the back ends. We'll look at that, how that works in just a moment. And once it's delivered to the back end, uh, in this case the node, the node will process it, performing destination network address translation, rewriting the destination, replacing the load balancer VIP with the IP address of a pod. In this example, I've chosen the IP address of a pod on the same node that received the packet, but that's not always the case. Uh, this would be with external traffic policy local. Pod would process the packet, and of course, the response packet will flip the source and destinations. And after processing, uh, the node will perform source network address translation, uh, changing the source from the pod IP to the load balancer's uh, VIP uh, IP address or forwarding rule IP. And then, of course, that response packet is sent on the network uh, back to the client. So if we sort of put all of this together, we sort of have a picture that looks kind of like that. The request packet, uh, destination NAT, processing the packet, and then source NAT. Uh, and this is, this is, again, I want to emphasize this is a little bit different from a proxy load balancer. The load balancer is not delivering packets to destinations uh, that match like a node port. We're, we're delivering it to the network interface of, of, the, uh, of the node, but we're preserving the destination IP address uh, uh, being the forwarding rule of the load balancer. And I like to call this type of load balancer, or this type of load balancing is like load balancer inclusive, because there's, there's this term for like container native if we're talking about proxies, where, we, where the proxy is able to communicate directly with the pod IP. But in this case, I, I think that term works, works out pretty well. And what I've shown you so far is an example that uses external traffic policy local. Um, there's two choices, and, and I presume everybody's familiar with this, local and cluster. And this helps the load balancer decide which nodes will receive these load balanced packets. Let's talk a little bit more about external traffic policy and how we group these nodes. Now, a little, little bit of information up front. I can't give you all possible examples. I only have a few minutes here. So most of my examples are going to fo uh, focus on external traffic policy local. But one method is we group the nodes using instance groups. And we, uh, those instance groups are comprised of all the nodes uh, from all node pools of the cluster. And we decide which nodes will receive the load balance packets by using the external traffic policy and load balancer health checks. So for example, if we have three nodes in a cluster and we use external traffic policy cluster, we would expect for all three of them to pass what we call the load balancer health check, whether or not the node actually contains a serving pod. And if we use external traffic policy local, we would expect for only those nodes to pass the load balancer health check if the node contains at least one pod that has passed its readiness probe, if defined, and is also not in a terminating state, which will be important in just a moment. Make a little smaller version of this so we can look at this. Little quick detour here. When I talk about load balancer health checks, these are packets that are sent from the load balancing infrastructure to assess whether or not a backend is healthy. These are not the same thing as a Kubernetes readiness or liveness probe. And they're also responded to, so, so the entity that receives these health check packets and the entity that replies to them would be something like Kube proxy or its material equivalent, like Cilium agent. And uh, that software will respond to them. And it does so based on uh, whether or not the, there is at least one pod that is not terminating and passing its readiness probe. So think about it like this. For external traffic policy cluster, we always pass the load balancer health check no matter what. For external traffic policy local, we pass it only if there is at least one pod that is passing its readiness probe and that's not terminating. Because from the perspective of the load balancer, the entity that it deals with are nodes uh, or network interfaces for nodes.
There's another way that, that we group, that, or that we can group uh, nodes that, that have serving pods, and that's to use network endpoint groups. And I'm only gonna show the example with external traffic policy local, but in this case, the same sort of things apply with one exception. Instead of grouping all the nodes into instance groups, what we do is we place only the nodes that have at least one serving pod that is not terminating and that has passed its readiness probe. So we kind of get one of these conditions for free. Uh, and of course, if there's a readiness probe, but that still has to, that still has to pass, that doesn't change. If you're curious about how we can group them using external traffic policy cluster using network endpoint groups, you can visit that URL there, but I need to sort of move along. So when, if we think about uh, using external traffic policy local, we want to define a meaningful readiness probe so that the load balancer health check uh, will actually be indi indicative of whether or not there is a serving pod that, that's ready to serve. And to think about this, we need to think about a, a couple of timelines here. So the load balancer's health check will pass or fail after the readiness probe passes or fails. I'm assuming that there is a readiness probe defined. And so if we think about from the perspective of a pod, when the pod starts up, you can define an initial delay seconds, and you can also define a period seconds and a timeout seconds for the readiness probe. And this repeats however many times you define it, and you specify a success threshold. Here we have an example of three. One other thing I'll mention is that, although I don't think the Kubernetes API actually enforces this, uh, for the purposes of, of this discussion and for sanity, assume that timeout seconds is less than, I, I should probably have said less than or equal to the period seconds, uh, just, just to sort of keep this simple. So if you think about when will the readiness probe pass, well, it might pass after, if we say the success threshold is three, it might pass after two periods and then a few seconds into the third period, or it might pass at the end of the timeout seconds within that third period. But a good way to estimate this is if you just say it's whatever the initial delay seconds happens to be plus the product of the success threshold and, and the period. That way you get sort of an upper bound. And that's helpful because there's another timeline that follows this when the load balancer health check passes. And that one starts uh, at the end of the first timeline. And the load balancer has a health check, which is defined in a very similar way. We don't call it period seconds, we call it interval, and we call it timeout. Uh, but same thing can happen. You can define a healthy threshold, and in this case, we've got two. And so all together, the time from starting the pod to the time when the load balancer health check passes, again, for external traffic policy local, that would be the time when it would accept new connections, would be the initial delay seconds, plus the product of the success threshold and the period seconds for the readiness pr probe, and also the product of the interval and the healthy threshold for the load balancer's health check. And so with that, we can have a picture of what an active backend happens to be for a load balancer. From the load balancer's perspective, the nodes that pass the load balancer health check are all that matters to be, a, to be an active backend. And the node grouping method and external traffic policy work together. So if we go back to life of a packet for just a minute, and we think external traffic policy local, we think about a cluster that has three nodes, two nodes have serving pods, none of the pods are terminating, and all of the pods pass their readiness check. So we're kind of in a steady state. So we have two nodes with serving pods will pass the load balancer health checks. That's what we expect. And uh, that means that those two nodes are the load balancer's active backends. So the picture looks kind of like this. Here's our request packet. And that goes to the load balancer. And now we're going to zoom in a little bit on the load balancer logic. So inside the load balancer, you can think of, of there's sort of two, two engines, two, two hash tables that, that, that are used. One is if we have a brand new connection, there's no connection tracking table entry created. So we have to pick a back end. And this is what I like to call the back end selection hash method. We refer to it as session affinity. So we need to pick a back end. We're going to use session affinity. If you're using a service of type load balancer in GKE Kubernetes, this will be a five tuple, tuple hash to pick the back end. And so you can think of that hash as a big number and we're gonna divide it by two because we've got two load balancer healthy nodes and we'll take the remainder. So that gives us a slot and the slot would correspond to a network interface of a node. And so we might pick say the network interface of node A. And then we can populate the connection tracking table with a five tuple hash of the source IP address, source port, 
IP protocol by number, destination IP address, which is the load balancer VIP, and destination port. And then, of course, the packet is delivered to, to the node, where the node will do destination that to send it to the pod. The pod will reply, and then the node will produce, uh, will, will, will perform source NAT and send it right back. And you notice when I sent it back, I skipped the load balancer. This is direct server return. So this is why we let the, why we let the node do, do the NAT and why it accepts the packet with the destination match and load balancer VIP. Now, the next time a packet comes in for this connection, we've already got a connection tracking table entry. So we don't have to play the back end selection hash method. We know where the packet needs to go, and the load balancer will deliver it there. And of course, that's what we get, just as before. Now, the connection tracking table entry is an interesting thing to focus on because it's good, it lasts as long as there are packets flowing for the connection. Every routing load balancer has a concept of an idle connection and how long the connection tracking table will last. For example, if you create a service of type load balancer and use the internal annotation in Google Cloud, by default, that idle time is 10 minutes, but you could manually set it to 16 hours. If you create an external service of type load balancer in, in Google Cloud, uh, that uh, connection tracking table lifetime is one minute. So this is where some interesting things happen. Idle connections. So when a connection tracking table entry is removed due to the connection being idle, so let's assume that's the case, the next packet that's processed for that connection is processed as if it's a first packet. Doesn't matter if there's a send flag set or not. But the next packet, of course, is not part of a new connection. It's part of the previous one. And so naturally, the question that comes up quite a bit uh, from a supportability perspective is when are idle connections problematic? And this is something I want to dig into a little bit because this is, this is some, some places where we've, we've been able to provide some advice to people. So the easiest place to start is when they're not problematic. They're not problematic as long as the number of active backends are constant. And so if you imagine kind of walk through the life of a packet, I did this in text form because drawing it was hard, but if we have a new TCP connection, load balancer picks the back end. You can kind of imagine my previous animation. We're gonna use session affinity to pick the back end. We'll create a connection tracking table entry and the connection tracking table entry maps that hash for the, for the packet characteristics to the node's network interface. And let's say the packet's delivered to the, to, the, to the node and the connection becomes idle for longer than the connection tracking table can tolerate. So the connection tracking table entry is evicted, but the client and the serving pod on the node still think the connection is alive. So the, the left and right parties think the connection is still active. The middle party, the load balancer, has cleared the connection tracking table. The next packet is sent from a client. So what the load balancer will do is it will pick a back end using the session affinity, aka backend selection hash algorithm, as if this were a new connection. Again, if, for, from the perspective of this hashing algorithm, it doesn't matter if it's actually a new connection or whether a SIN flag is set. Good thing here is that the number of active backends is constant, so we pick the same backend and we build an identical connection tracking table entry. So not a problem, the new connection tracking table entry will route the packets to the same node that the previous uh, connection tracking table entry did because they're identical entries. Now the fun part. <laughs> when the idle connections are problematic, when the number of backends changes and a connection tracking table entry is removed. So we'll go through the first parts, new TCP connection, pick a backend, connection tracking table created, Okay, we route packets to the node, connection becomes idle, and the connection tracking table entry is evicted. Now, the client and the serving pod still think the connection is active, so a next packet is sent. But if the number of active backends, nodes, are, is different, has changed, then the load balancer will pick a backend using a session affinity hash again, and there's a good chance it will pick a different, uh, different node. So a new connection tracking table entry is created, but this one's different. And let's say that it picks a different node and the first packet that that node receives will be, let's assume TCP, uh, will be a packet that does not carry the SIN flag. So that's delivered to the NIC of, of a new node. A new node will be rather nonplussed by this. So the kernel of the node will issue a TCP reset. This is correct behavior. And the part that I think surprises a lot of people, because I'm always asked is, where do we find this in logs? And the answer is you don't. It, it happens at the kernel level, so there's nothing in application logs. And again, the idea is to tell the client to, to reestablish a connection. 
So idle connections are problematic when the number of active backends changes and there's uh, no connection tracking table entry present. So I've kind of come up with a grid of advice that we've used kind of internally in Google. Uh, if the total number of nodes in your cluster varies, but the number of nodes with serving pods is constant, then the goal is to keep the active backend count stable and you should use external traffic policy local because that's the part that's stable, only the nodes that are passing the, the load bouncer's health check. If the total nodes is constant, but the number of serving pods is variable, same goal, but we're gonna use external traffic policy cluster. I suppose I could have put a fourth column here if they're both constant, but we'll say that's a strict subset of the left column. There, so again, here we're, we're, we're using external traffic policy and we're going to try to keep the connection uh, uh, or we're going to try to uh, have a situation where if the connection goes idle, a new connection tracking table is entry, entry is created and it's identical to the first. But this is the real fun one, when both are variable. And this is unavoidable sometimes. So the goal here is don't let the connection go idle. And for that, you can use either external traffic policy local, but you want to use TCP keep alives. And I would say if in doubt, use TCP keep alives. And if we think about TCP keep alive just a little bit, uh, this is something that is also, I, I find, is, is a little bit confused. When I say a TCP keep alive, I don't mean an HTTP keep alive. That's a TCP idle. When I'm talking about a TCP keep alive, you can follow the link there. It's a situation where the client and the server will periodically send a zero payload packet to, to pump the connection tracking table and keep it active. So to do this, application code has to open a socket with the keep alive option set. And then you can configure two keep alive parameters, either using uh, kernel defaults or at the time that the, that the socket is created. And each of these things have a different meaning. The first one uh, defines the amount of time from the last packet to when the first keep alive packet is sent. And the second defines the interval thereafter. And of course, there's also a parameter for controlling how many keep alives are sent. And there's a couple different ways to do this. So you can see here's, here's how to set kernel defaults. If syscuttle is available in your container, you can use that. Uh, or you can write uh, to, to one of those paths in the, in the proc file system. Uh, and, and this is namespace, so you, you can do this uh, from within a, within a container. Uh, here's an example. And, and there's also an example from, uh, I decided to pick sort of one of the more complex examples. Uh, big shout out to our friends at F5 here for this example because it's on their support site. Uh, this is Istio and Envoy as an example. Um, you can configure this using an Envoy filter. Uh, and I would not have guessed how to do this myself because it's a little, bit, a little bit complicated, but here's the option that sets uh, keep alive. Here's the option that sets the time to the first keep alive packet. And here is the, the interval. So you can do this in the application code or you can do this uh, at the kernel layer if your application code uh, opens up a socket and doesn't specify custom parameters. And finally, if we want to talk about other situations where things might change, like if you're rolling out increasing or decreasing the number of serving pods uh, during, during a rollout. So let's just assume that total nodes uh, are, is variable and the number of, of pods with serving nodes is also variable. And we already covered, we don't want to let the connection go idle. So our second goal is to allow existing connections to close naturally. Uh, because anytime you do a rollout, you're going to terminate pods. So let's think about terminating pods. So we want the load bouncer health check to fail quickly in order to repel new connections. And we need the serving pod to keep processing packets uh, for a duration that we find reasonable to meet your needs for existing connections, uh, even after the load bouncer health check has failed. And I'd like to break goal two up into two pieces. We want to fail the load bouncer health check quickly. And again, remember how the load bouncer health check varies based on external traffic policy. And we also want to keep uh, processing packets for a reasonable amount of time. Here is a, a sort of three trains leave the station when, when we're terminating a pod. And these three trains are, these three timelines happen uh, in, in, in series with each other, so, or sorry, in, in parallel with each other, so not in series. Uh, we have the amount of time that it takes for the pre-stop uh, execution to finish before SIG term. We've got termination grace period seconds, and then of course we've got the load balancer's interval and unhealthy count. And so any time while the load balancer health check is still passing, but the pod is terminating, there's a nice Kubernetes enhancement called KEP 1669, proxy terminating endpoints, which does the right thing. It tries to route packets to a terminating pod if as a last resort. 
and then after the load balancer health check has failed, you can sort of manipulate the, the pre-stop execution time and termination grace period seconds. Some software will, will stop processing packets at the SIG term, others at the SIG kill. So just a quick summary here. If your software stops at SIG term, uh, modify your pre-stop execution time and make termination grace period seconds sufficiently long. Uh, otherwise, just termination grace period seconds. And you want to kind of adhere to this. So those, that's the relationship, but the load balancer health check time to unhealthy is sort of your lower bound. So if you know the load balancer health check will fail after, you know, five, let's say five second uh, in intervals, two of them, that's about 10 seconds. So, you know, your pre-stop needs to be at least 10 seconds, potentially longer. However, you decide that needs to be to bleed off existing connections and then uh, termination grace period seconds uh, is your upper bound. And I think I've got this right on the nose as far as time. So I hope, uh, I hope you all enjoyed this. Thank you very much. Yeah. yeah thanks.